Okay, so, well, thank you. That was amazing. That was really interesting. Uh, so this panel is about the law of the horse. Um, so the idea is that all those new technologies are raising a lot of uh, really interesting legal challenges. There is a lot of discussion about how we're supposed to regulate those technology, how can we make them comply with the current legal framework, and uh, what, are the, what are the challenges that we have to address. So the idea with this, with this panel is we want to kind of flip the discussion around. Um, instead of looking at what is the viability of blockchain-based application, or how can we change or frame those new technologies so that they can actually comply with the current legal framework, we actually want to explore the viability of the current legal framework to those new technology. So we want to try and understand whether the, we are in this situation just like at the, at the early 90s when the new digital technology and when the internet came in and then there was this discussion about, okay, this is like a new, a new cyberspace, a new space that the traditional legal system is having a really hard time to cope with. And so on, we, we can address the problem in two ways. One way is like we have to understand how we shape this technology and how we make it fit within the, the current regulatory framework. Um, on the other hand, we need to understand how we have to reform the law and how the regulatory framework needs to adjust itself in order to comply with those new technology, in order to, to support them, and in order to um, put them into a framework that is consistent with the traditional uh, rule of law. So, um, well, the um, blockchain application are obviously bringing a lot of innovation. Um, it starts everything with Bitcoin. Uh, we now have this decentralized cryptocurrency that operates independently of any government or central bank. Um, we have this process of disintermediation. We can now create do-it-yourself banking. We can create new distributed and new distributed application. Um, we have the smart contract. We have the automated transaction, etc. Distributed organization, new governance system. Uh, a lot of new applications which are difficult. It, it, uh, it is difficult for the regulatory framework to understand how to make them fit. Uh, what, what, what is it when we're talking about a smart contract? Is it actually a contract? Is it a valid contract? And how do we make it to be a valid contract? What is crypto equity? Should it be uh, dealt with in the same way as equity or not? Um, is a distributed organization to be regulated according to the traditional real or corporate law, or is it something completely different that requires a different model? So um, to begin the discussion, I would like, well, if everyone uh, on the panel, if you can introduce yourself shortly, and then if you can say, according to you, what is this one application uh, of blockchain-based application that has this really strong impact and that is likely to disrupt the traditional uh, system, the, the traditional regulatory framework. Um, if you want to start, Josh. Sure. Anything on? All right. Josh Fairfield, Washington Lee University. Um, I think that one of the applications that we're going to see disrupted is the is our property systems. Um, registry is registries are the law of property. Most wealth is not physical, it's in a list somewhere with your bank, with your, um, your registry title for your home, um, the Uniform Commercial Code personal property registry system where we register, for example, the bank's loan on your car. Um, those systems simply are entries in databases. Um, they're incredibly hard to find, they're incredibly hard to link, could and you, you we'll have some... Up or could you turn him up? Okay, I can move in much closer. Let's try that. Better? Usually. Good. So I think one application that is going to be uh, property registry systems in which we have entries in your bank account, that's one, but entries in your local property registry for your house or the loan for your car. All of these different registries are simply entries in a database and they're going to be much easier to link together if we can have a public database that churns um, where people can see immediately who has moved which objects to whom. Um, I think that we can even take that as far as uh, an effective, for once, marketplace for digital objects. 
think about a marketplace for used MP3s. Redigi was sued out of existence in New York for trying to let you sell your old Britney Spears collection. And I think that with a digital object system, we can run property systems for MP3s. We can run them just, the same, just as easily as we can run them for the title for your yacht or the mortgage or the deed for your house. Thank you. Kathleen Moriarty, can you hear me? Um, I'm a lawyer, so uh, I rarely have time to think about hypotheticals or what things should be. Mostly I deal with things that either have happened or shouldn't have happened um, and how to deal with that. But it's interesting that, that Josh said what he did because in thinking about this, I think if you look at the um, English and then American and Australian and other Commonwealth countries, um, the basis of common law started out with property. That was what mattered to people then, not privacy, not a bunch of other things. They cared about who owned what in terms of land. That was all that mattered. I think that you're right that the blockchain and, and applications will make a big difference. I think it will um, be much more efficient, be more transparent. I think the one area that you will see a huge pushback on will be real property because it is so embedded in our system and people are so devoted to it that I think it will be, it'll be a harder thing to change than it will for car leases or um, other things. So I just, I just put that out there as a, as a thought. Um, from my perspective, I don't think of things, I don't think of particular things that will make a difference. I think that the area, I think that I, the issue of identity and how it's solved could be very disruptive or maybe not disruptive at all. I think it depends on, on how we deal with it. And I think it's incredibly important. And um, I think it, it challenges us to think about what identity really is. I remember when I first started reading about this, and reading about you know multifaceted identity, I thought multifaceted identity, you know, I, I just sort of thought of myself as one set of things in a package. And when I started reading you know, stuff about this, I realized now it could be atomized into many different layers. And I think most people don't think about it that way. And I think it's something we need to think about. Um, I don't necessarily advocate that I have a, an answer, but I think, I think that issue is critically important in all of this and has to be remembered uh, as we go forward. Hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Wright. Um, I'm at Cardoza Law School in New York. Um, I think the most interesting part about uh, blockchain technology is really it's the next layer of the Internet. So we have, I think, a nervous system for the Internet that we've been living with for the past 20 years. And I think the blockchain really represents kind of a memory for the Internet, a collective space where we can store and retrieve information. And I think that's going to have profound impacts on how we organize society, um, you know, from identity to property to the ability to actually... Uh, collectively organize ourselves into new entities through things such as smart contracts. And I think that, you know, this is going to kind of present a lot of positives and also a lot of negatives. Um, but the, the, the potential that we have, I think, at this moment and using this technology is to really build new global digital infrastructure. Uh, so we're already beginning to see a global digital infrastructure for payments, a, a payment system that everybody can use regardless of where they exist on the planet. Um, with smart contracts and other emerging technologies, we can also see the emergence of global uh, marketplaces. So actually, you know, decentralized stock, market, stock markets, matchmaking functionality, which you can do now because if you have a, a memory for the Internet, you can store pieces of, of information and everybody can access it. And I think even beyond that, now you, you're building a payment system, you're building a market, marketplaces. You can start building organizations where um, that that are decentralized organizations that aren't necessarily owned by shareholders in a corporation, but are kind of an evolution of our peer-to-peer -peer economy that we're beginning to, but that we also are beginning to see emerge over the last 15 uh, years. Um, and what we can do with that, I think, is start to experiment again with how we collectively organize ourselves. Um, and maybe, you know, it, this is this is all hypothetical, but maybe we'll start to see new emergent organizations, uh, maybe even new ways to kind of organize ourselves in terms of governance. Another thing when you have a collective memory that is conceivably possible, although there's some challenges to it, is voting. You know, if we have a digital global voting systems, uh, we may be able to uh, combine all these things and actually add some juice to it. So you know, uh, one of the big functionalities of corporations is really 
voting and distributing you know, people's will inside of an organization. Um, and I think what's, what's promising and challenging at the same time is when you start building these digital infrastructures, uh, how to do them in a the right way. You know, is this kind of an embodiment of, of what we're trying to do in the US or in, in the Western world? Or is it some sort of digital colonialism uh, you know, where we're imposing uh, kind of these global systems on everybody else? Um, and I also think there's an, a really exciting sp uh, spot when you kind of combine the Internet of Things with blockchain technology and you start to, to really think deeply about what it means to have the Internet in every single device and how it can actually get control of using blockchain technology and smart contracts. So how you can actually blend together our cyberspace with our, with our meat space. Um, and so I think that those are the challenges <laughs> that we're going to be uh, having to grapple with over the next you know, 15, 20 years as this next wave of the internet kind of emerges. Hi, I'm, I'm Constance. Um, I'm also a technology civil liberties lawyer. Um, uh, for me, you know, I, I have to agree with all the panelists. Um, you know, this is really um, a new kind of infrastructure, a global infrastructure. And, you know, just as it has, it's a distributed ledger that allows you to prove control and transfer of a scarce resource or digital good. So we can apply that to a, a number of things, you know, like just like property and deeds. But more important than that, I think, you know, we're moving from, you know, a very centralized world into um, a decentralized infrastructure. So the kinds of uh, power, the, the kinds of um, authorities and um, uh, repositories of, of, of verification that we've relied on, like the DMV, like um, like a property registry, that we we can do that using blockchain in a in a um, automated and trustless way. So, um, you know, I think you're going to see um, a, uh, some um, efficiencies and maybe some disruptions going on in the way that we uh, that we that we mediate any kind of digital good. I think more more importantly than that. Um, uh, this in infrastructure really allows, for the first time, entire communities um, and cities, organizations, to be able to self-organize in, in real time and in, in, in a uh, verifiable way. So for the first time, you have infrastructure where any, any community can decide to build in a secure um, communication and value transfer system that adheres to, you know, maybe their... their um, their own uh, values. So the thing about cyberspace, of course, is that um, it operates logically. It doesn't operate geographically. So you're, you know, with this infrastructure, communities can build in their own kinds of logic and values in, in their own systems. And so I think what will be really interesting, actually, is to see how we, as a society, evolve. We have the tools now to build a secure infrastructure that reflects our values. You know what kinds of values will we will we port into to this new world? I think will be very interesting, um, and uh, in ter in terms of um, you know even even if you look at I, I think another area where where this will actually really play out is uh, putting sunshine on a lot of opaque industries. You know right now um, the ability to really verify data to really say that something happened or what something cost is actually very difficult. You know GDP um, everyone says GDP is the cake. And in everything else, you know, all the, the care that we do, all, the, all that informal economy is, act, is the icing. And now people are realizing that actually the real value creation in society is, 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 uh, is, is that uncounted bit. And it's GDP that's just that icing. And so if we can somehow use blockchain technologies to actually track and measure how value is actually being created as we experience it, rather than you know how many jobs you manufactured on the on, on your ledger for that year for a particular country, um, I think you could see some really really um, fundamental changes and perhaps a leveling of that asymmetry of information. That's great, uh, John. John Klippinger, I'm um, with the Media Lab at MIT and also uh, co-founder of a Institute for Data-Driven Design uh, with Sandy Pentland uh, from MIT. Um, was, coming at the end of these comments, it's sort of difficult to pr provide something totally new. Um, <laughs> but then it maybe it's, it's a point of emphasis uh, that I, some things that I think are very important and very profound. And, and I do go back with John, uh, having been inspired by Tia de Chardin and the whole idea of uh, as a sort of um, emergent zeitgeist, um, and that that how is how do you have self-ordering systems that um, 
can evolve over periods of time and sort of be headless in the way you're describing it. And I think having always been interested in that for many, many years, uh, I think the blockchain is the beginning of that. Is you can have self-deploying uh, uh, infrastructures, you can have systems that, sort of, that cr uh, sort of correct themselves. I think that the, one of the important points about sort of uh, decentralized autonomous organizations and contracts, smart contracts, and this is something I've been working with, uh, actually goes back to Oliver when we had to do something at the, at the law lab at Harvard, is uh, it's not only having the, the contracts, you know, contracts or, or, or laws can be ruled, but they're algorithms, and they actually enforce themselves, and they play the role of a state. And once you start to do that, and it's trustless in a sense, you don't have a third party, and you have a, a, a public record. Everything can go on a record. I mean, that's so profound that we can capture all the data, put it on a record, anyone can look at it. That, that sort of changes the whole equation of what the role of governance in the state is. It really does. So you can't, you can't uh, look aside from that. And I think where this is a particularly acute and something area that I've been interested in is in the area of identity and the ability of authorities to create credentials that create or deny opportunities to people. Typically, that's been very hierarchical. That's been very static. It's been one of the so invariants over time. Now, when you think about that as being highly dynamic, decentralized, and being run by decentralized autonomous authorities, which can issue credentials, deny credentials, and in a secure way, I mean, then also you have an opportunity for a new notion of justice. I mean, it's, the concept of justice is, is a uh, sort of a tr is tr justice requires something to be trustless. In other words, you run the contract, it performs this way, uh, and it can't be tampered with. It starts to raise all sorts of questions about how we delegate agency into a device and how we can pull it back and how the device itself will have its own agency, its own personhood. Uh, these are very profound questions we've never had before. Um, so it does create an enormous opportunity to rethink fundamental institutions um, and design and implement and test and scale them, but it also creates other possibilities that have been totally novel to us, so I think as a species. Uh, well, I'm John Perry Barlow. You, you heard uh, a lot of what I had to say before, but, but in, the, in reference to this, this panel, um, couple of things come to mind. Uh, there was a time in the 90s when I was, I was uh, Wired Magazine and I was, I was also doing a lot of uh, theorizing about, um, about what, what money could be <clears throat> in a frictionless environment and I was, I was writing um, uh, white papers for uh, Herb Allison who was then head of uh, Merrill Lynch that you know in some respects became part of the problem now. Uh, in the sense that, you know, what I was saying was that, that any place there was a delta, any difference, you could insert an electronic probe into that delta and you could, you could extract value from that delta and that would be like money. And it would, you know, I thought it was money actually. I was going around saying we, we had finally beaten the system, we could get something for nothing indefinitely. I was completely crazy. Um, but a lot of people liked this idea and they were going along with it. <laughs> I mean, I was, Future Banker Magazine called me one of the 25 most influential people in financial services and I wasn't even in financial services. So uh, the, the consequence is that enough of, these, enough of these bad ideas stuck so that now you have uh, a system where there's a huge amount of the economy that is like a tumor. Uh, where value or something that appears to be value is adhering increasingly to a small group of institutions and people because they can grab it by, the, by using those electronic tools that, we, that I, was, I was proposing they use. And uh, even, well, at one point, I must tell you, that it became unclear what money was. I think it is now unclear what money is and what value is. Uh, at one point I asked a bunch of, of presidents of banks, I was speaking to the American Banking Institute and uh, there were several members of the Federal Reserve Board and I, I realized as I was coming down the elevator in the Mayflower Hotel that I was coming down the malaria spike. I've been spending a lot of time in, in Africa and malaria spikes are kind of like those flashbacks that they promised and never delivered on. 
So <laughs> when I got down there, I was fully delirious, and I said, listen, I'm, uh, I'm going to start out, and I'm going to give you some time. Uh, can anybody here tell me what money is? And they took a while. And finally, somebody said, I think money is whatever Alan Greenspan says it is, which unfortunately was such a good answer that I had to accept it. <laughs> Uh, and that, and therein lies a real significant part of the problem because, because I then said, all right, what, what is value? And they, they started to go on, you know, in sort of Chicago School of Economics value. Uh, and I said, oh, wait a second. Let's suppose that I, that I am an angel. I've come into the room and I felt like one. Uh, I've come into the room and I'm going to give you a minute to decide whether you're going to keep all of your, all of your, your assets uh, both personal and corporate, or all of your relationships, both personal and corporate, which are you going to keep? And I said, all right, who goes with their assets? And I, nobody. I said, well, some of you are lying, but you know that that's the right way to lie, and, and, and why do you do that? And somebody said, well, I know I can rebuild my assets from my, from my relationships, but not the other way around. So, I think, I, I said, well, now, why do we have economic theory that places all of the emphasis on, on your assets and what you can count when the thing that really counts to you uh, is completely unmeasured? Now, I think that one of the things that can happen with the blockchain or uh, currency that has the, the kind of interoperable flu fluidity and, and different forms of currency is to actually come up with economic systems that will place some discernible value on relationships uh, and, will, and will make it more and more difficult for people to use this stuff that appears to be money but isn't really anymore, since there's an infinite supply of it, uh, to, you know, I mean, and, and the stuff is really, as far as I can tell, all you can do with it is, is buy hookers and Coke and, and Lamborghinis. You can't, you can't, I'm, I'm in presently trying to do infrastructure. I'm, I'm doing wastewater and, and uh, fuel development and that kind of thing and trying to get ca capital, old school, make your money the old fashioned way. You make a profit, you know, you know you, it's not market cap, it's, it's whether or not you're, you're in business. There's almost no money in this, in this economy available for that kind of thing. I had to go to the Japanese for it, and, and, and <laughs> that's been problematic, too. Um, my life is like bridge over the River Kwai on a good day. But uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think that we can, we can start to, to really come up with new systems of currency that reflect the way in which we deal with it, and, and, and just finally, to get back to the point about authority and order and, and rights, uh, about the time that, that Mitch Capor and I realized that we were trying to defend the Bill of Rights in cyberspace, and it was a, and it was a set of local ordinances, actually, <laughs> rather like the FCC might as well be the, you know, a group of county commissioners. I, this idea that they're going to somehow <laughs> impose net neutrality on, on the internet <laughs> is such wonderful folly. Uh, anyway, I, I, I said, how are we going to be able to assure rights uh, if, if we don't have governments of any sort? And he said, well, architecture is politics. We just have to make sure that the architecture conveys those rights. That every time we have a choice, uh, we choose an architecture that, that makes it easier to speak freely. We choose an architecture that makes it easier to have an identity. We choose an architecture that makes it easier not to have an identity. So. OK, thank you. Um, so I will now try to explain the title of this panel, and then we can have like a short discussion about whether what, what is the opinion of the panelists. So um, the idea is like the, the law of the horse, right? So um, when the internet came out, when the new digital technology became popularized, then there has been in academia this discussion of introducing the concept of cyber law, right? Uh, the idea was that cyber law will constitute a distinct body of law because it operates according to different logics and principles. Now, 
this created some kind of controversy uh, to the extent that some people notably say that, in fact, cy the cyberspace does not, is not that unique and does not have like those distinctive characteristics to justify to regard it as like an independent body of law, right? So most notably, Frank uh, Easterburg, which then compared the, um, the concept of the law of the cyberspace with the concept of the law of the Earth. Uh, the underlying idea is wh why do we actually need to create a separate body of law for the cyberspace or for the horse uh, instead of simply applying the traditional <coughs> body of law, so telecommunication law, privacy law, copyright law, etc., and simply extend them to the cyberspace by analogy. Now, Lessig was uh, a strong proponent of saying, no, in fact, uh, this, is, this has nothing to do with the uh, law of force because the cyberspace is different. And because it is different, we cannot just apply by analogy traditional legal concept. Um, the main difference is indeed the concept of architecture. So um, in the real world, we have the architecture which is dictating our behavior, but the law has, is the regulatory force which is, which is influencing what we will do or will not do. On the, on the internet, because the architecture becomes so easy to modify, it becomes so malleable, then the code becomes the main regulatory forces which will dictate what we can or we cannot do. Um, oftentimes, independently of the law, so the code can be used to replicate the law, but the code can also be used to create a de facto regulatory uh, system. So the, the, the question that I would like to open to the panel is, um, where are we now? So. Uh, we have this new technology, we have the blockchain, we have those new applications that are emerging. They have, uh, as you all described, they have those new, uh, it, it, is, it is almost a new paradigm. There is something changing which the current regulatory frame does not understand properly. So my question is, uh, we have those smart contracts with self-enforced uh, automated transactions. We have distributed organization, uh, which can sometimes be autonomous, which are like self-sufficient, independent. Etc. So, are we actually in this situation in which we are talking about like crypto law in the same way as we were, as we might have been talking about the law of the horse, that we are just like creating those new body of law, but in fact it is actually the same as cyber law? Or are there in fact like a sufficient shift of paradigm that will actually require changing the the, the way in which we are thinking about the law? and instead trying to explore, like open the window and trying to identify where are we going and whether we actually need to build something that is different, that is distinct from the traditional uh, cyber law. Please go. Well, so um, Frank Easterbrook, Judge Easterbrook, who started the Law of the Horse discussion, um, I, I had him as a professor at the University of Chicago Law School for a course called Defunct Legal Doctrines. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and it's my favorite course in law school. And so we need to talk about Frank Easterbrook's view and why it was right and why it was wrong. So Frank Easterbrook's right. There are fewer and fewer courses on cyber law being taught. And when you ask lawyers and law professors about what happens with the blockchain, they say things like, it's going to change property law. It's going to change contract law. It's going to change the law of organizing ourselves, democracy. They don't say it's going to create a new area called crypto law. However, Frank Easterbrook was dead wrong. What he missed was that it's not that technology law is a separate category from the common law. It's that the common law, all of it, is technology law. That is, new cases come to judges when new technologies open new markets and the legacy stakeholders fight against the arising order holders over who's going to be able to control the new assets. We see this again and again. So our theme is to, to switch this, right, to talk less about how is law going to shape Bitcoin or law is going to shape cryptocurrency is going to talk instead about how this technology is going to reshape law. And I think it's important that we understand this will not be a small niche area. It's going to reshape the whole enchilada. Right? It's going to reshape, reshape um, all of these different areas. So I'd like to just add a bit of a framework to what John was saying about a rising order and how that works with technology and law. Um, I'll, I'll define law as... Uh, using here America's sole serious contribution to world philosophy, which is American pragmatism. 
And that's a, that's a set of ideas that says basically, look, if legal rules or any set of rules don't change your behavior, right, or if your beliefs don't change your behavior, then you really don't, you really don't have those beliefs. They don't, or at least they don't matter in any serious way. So I'll say law is the set of rules that actually changes our behavior. Now technology renders a lot of those rules obsolete, right? That is, there are rules on the books saying you have to go ahead of your automobile um, shouting so that people, so that you don't scare all the horses when you drive your automobile through town. Those laws are on the books, they just don't change our behavior. I don't take them to be law, right? So then evolutionarily, what we're saying is that the, that law, the law that currently exists is that law which has, by crude analogy to evolution, is that law which has proven resistant to technological change. So those rules that are still useful to us in the face of rapid technological change. Now that means, that's odd, where does law come from? Well, it certainly doesn't come from legislatures or from courts. Um, it comes from all of us all the time. A very famous article written by Robert Cover called Nomos and Narrative um, called judges the jurispathic office. That is, judges don't create law, they kill it, right? They decide out of 100,000 rules that communities have generated to order their own behavior, they decide which rule is going to survive and they kill all the others. <laughs> They kill a lot more rules than they create. The famous line is, theirs is the jurispathic office. Okay? So <laughs> that's what the relationship between technology and law is. Technology opens up fora for new rules to grow. They grow like weeds. We then begin to weed them out, to kill off the ones that aren't working, to accept the ones that are, and that this is an ongoing, extraordinarily rapid process that grows ahead and, in fact, faster than technology grows. And that's not a, that's not a common idea, that law is already waiting when technology gets there. <laughs> but it's true. It's just you have to change what law is. And so, um, so I know the end the in fact, you know, code is law. So we, we have this understanding that the law is becoming more and more uh, pervasive and it's, it, it becomes the tool that government and corporation, actually individual, can use in order to uh, either organize themselves or impose some rules on others. Now, one thing that I think is interesting to address here is, uh, so obviously the law, then if the law doesn't regulate directly the individual because the technology is a better tool to regulate the individual, but the law can nonetheless regulate the technology in order to indirectly regulate the individual, right? Um, and this is what is happening uh, with the cyber law on the internet. So we regulate the intermediaries, we regulate the providers, and etc. Now what is interesting with the blockchain is that we're actually losing this intermediary, right? Because now the technology is uh, well, it, it's not operating on one server, it's operating on the blockchain. And so what kind of, um, what, what becomes the, the, uh, the subject of the regulation? Uh, how can we actually regulate this technology when the producer of the technology are actually the user of the technology? And so either you have to regulate directly the end user, or what, is, what becomes the new means for the law to actually have an, an, an impact on how the technology should be shaped so that the technology doesn't go beyond the real of the law. Could I say something quickly? Uh, you know, I, I think it's a bad law that changes your behavior. Uh, it, it's a good law that ratifies it. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, it's a good law that, that recognizes uh, what is social practice and, and makes it so that, that people who are outliers recognize I'll take the friendly amendment, laws that express the beliefs, that is, that follow the beliefs. Right. But, I, but I, just quickly, I, I want to I suggest the possibility that one of the things that we have here is the opportunity um, to have law that adapts very quickly to a particular circumstance uh, and is enforceable by the code, as Larry would put it, uh, or the architecture, as Mitch Kapoor would have, uh, and and may only apply in a certain set of circumstances that are that are agreeable within sure. that venue and context. Uh, and I think you'll you'll see a lot of that. And so one of the things that you should bear in mind as you design these systems is is making them ductile in in precisely that way, so you don't have to worry about the judge or the legislature or anybody else, you just simply have to worry about what is 
the, the social practice and expectation and considered to be decent, proper behavior of that group of people that are going to be governed by the contract or the set of the set of principles that are going to be uh, embedded in the machinery that, that the blockchain is imposing, or not imposing, but is expressing um, during that process. Yeah, just just as a just to to one. So I it's like common law, common law with teeth. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the thing is that, of course, law is should ratify the behavior, but then law should also make sure that other actors are not impinging upon the liberty of others. Uh, we have a lot of consumer protection law, and like there is like intermediaries needs to be regulated so that the user that use the service that they provide are uh, not being like exploited. Or be exactly. I mean, yeah, of course. But so the question will be like. If we don't have the intermediary anymore, then what, what kind of tool we have to regulate and to make sure that everything, so the, the law ratify the behavior of the individual, but we have to make sure that the technology that is being deployed is also consistent with the behavior of the, of the individuals. Oh, I, look, you know, I, 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 when I was writing the declaration, uh, I mean, I didn't get, have an opportunity to give it a lot of thought since I was just doing it to send out to friends. I wasn't planning on it being some canonical document. But I, I did spend about 20 minutes, I think, trying to figure out what everybody could agree on. And I, I, it, it struck me that I had never been any place on the planet where they didn't have some version of the golden rule, where people wanted to be treated as, as uh, you know, they want, the, the, uh, the ideal was that you would treat others as you wanted to be treated. And that would be the that would be something that basically everybody could agree on whether they practiced it or not. And I, I mean, I think that that's the, what we're kind of driving towards is kind of an expansion of that architecture. So, um, you know, Larry Lessig said code is law. Um, but, you know, the internet, the law of the internet doesn't fully control us or doesn't have the possibility to really effectuate and, uh, and, and lead to self-ordering. But I think now when you add this, this global supercomputer that we can all plug into, this memory layer, uh, we can begin to kind of actually add some teeth uh, to, to the self-ordering. Um, and in that process, we have the possibility in certain instances to kind of thin the middleman in certain significant instances. And I think when you do that, there's some benefits to the middleman. When you look at it from a, a legal perspective, a lot of times the law or the regulators, they apply the regulation on the middleman because A, they're extracting some superhuman value, B, it's, a, it's an efficient way for them to, to implement something. So I think as we begin to move from a world where we can do a little bit more self-ordering, maybe it might not go as, as far as we, we, we might idealize, um, I think then what that leads is more pressure on deeper inter intermediaries and middlemen that we have. Um, and I think what, what the, the downside to, to this, if we don't plan this right from a legal perspective, is that some fundamental notions of the internet, such as you know the protection of ISPs that we've been uh, pretty vigilant in protecting over the past 20 years, they could increasingly be forced to play the role of the middleman to decide which, um, you know, what types of protection of IP did you say? The ISPs, yeah, oh, ISPs. the ISPs, um, and I think that there will be an increasing um, you know pressure to to regulate users. Um, it is it has been fairly effective. We've seen you know the, the copyright lobby. Uh, effectively go after users as a deterrent. Uh, so I, th I think as we increasingly gain the ability to, to self-order using this technology, um, we'll, we'll begin to see a thinning of some middlemen, and that thinning of some middlemen will in turn apply more pressure onto our deep, the deeper levels of the internet stack. And that's, uh, I think, what we need to be mindful of and careful mm -hmm. of. And that's why I think it's important to think of novel ways to regulate that, uh, to not use these kind of blunt force objects of regulating ISPs for regulating maybe hardware, uh, you know, for, for regulating things like search engines and other things like that, and focusing more on how can we effectively incentivize people to build good systems. Mm -hmm. I'll, yeah, I'll add to, oh, well, go ahead. Oh, yeah. oh. If code is law and, 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 and architecture is law, then um, then the kinds of, 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 of architecture that we pick, you know, based on what we know now in this nascent technologies is, is incredibly important. So um, if you pick uh, if you pick an architecture right now um, with with the kind of visibility that you have now, the code just executes. So I think it's very important that we as a society 
um, as we build this code, as we decide and examine the trade-offs of the various technological tools that we have at our hand, that we don't carry some of the paradigms of the legacy world into this very, very much more elastic, multi-dimensional world. If we, if we treat this world as though it's flat instead of round, um, we're going to get some very absurd results. Um, if we treat um, the kinds of, of, of resources that are at hand in this world in the same kind of zero-sum game that we've done in the old world, we're going to reproduce that same, same result, and it'll be exponential because the code will execute. But so, we won't be able to reproduce it. Mm. It just it won't work. Well, there's yeah. a tension. I, I, what, what, I, what I'd like to build is build on the point is this idea. I mean, you have the. I get nervous, but there's the, the law with a capital L on top of this, and that because I think what you're getting is emergent order, and you're able to, and that's the con common law concept. And I, I'd like to read a quote from Holmes. Uh, on the common law and early forms of liability. And, and it was written in 1884, and, and he actually took an evolution of a biological notion of what the law was. And he looked at it evolving from norms and customs into, into common law, and then constantly re, re, reinventing itself, adapting to itself. So it didn't necessarily have a, a fixed logical form, but it was, it was really a form of, of how do you create social cohesion, expression, and ordering. And to me, this is remarkable when it was, uh, when it was written. And it says, the, the rule, and it could be, a, you could say, algorithm, adapts itself to the new reasons which have been found for it and enters into a new career. The old form receives a new content. And in time, even this form modifies itself to fit the meaning which it has received. I mean, this is a, this, this notion of a very kind of living law. And it's decentralized, distributed, reinventing itself. Uh, and adapting to its local terms. And so how do you design systems? So we wrote about something called digital common law and how do you create digital institutions that have certain properties of openness to themselves. And I, I, so not as contracts sort of execute and enforce themselves, thereby relieving some of the, was trip, typically a state function, but you know, they can learn. So it's rather than, if it fails, it, you're, we're moving to the point where we get smarter contracts, part of the smartness of the contract is to see what its failure conditions were and correct that, I think quickly, just the, the thing to always ask yourself is, does it enable responsibility or does it enable obligation? Yep. You know, if it's, if it's well, right. I mean, right now, we have the choice of creating uh, um, an ordering system for ourselves within many different circumstances that are arising from our mutual responsibility and not somebody else's imposition of an obligation on us. So uh, I, I think we suddenly have a new power uh, legally that we have not had before, and, I, and it would be good for everybody to just simply eliminate the word should from all their sentences uh, and, uh, and just, just think about what they want and will do. Okay, so we're running out of time. Just like to, to, to conclude, I will just like to ask one, one question uh, to John Perrybal, but actually to everyone. Uh, so you've heard about the independence of the cyberspace and uh, the, with the internet being described as like this space for freedom that will not be regulated and et cetera. Today, when we look at the internet, it has turned into this tool of like mass surveillance and control. Um, do you, how do you feel about the blockchain? Do you feel that, um, the blockchain, will, will you feel comfortable of writing some kind of declaration of the independence of the blockchain, or do you think that it's actually just the same thing, like we have this new tool uh, which has an enormous potential, but then eventually it's just going to be regulated and regulated as the corporate um, figure out how to do that? I think that, you know, I mean, as I say, I knew at the time that I was declaring the internet to be the greatest, the greatest uh, liberating force in the history of humanity, which it is, uh, I also knew that it was going to be the greatest surveilling system that had ever been devised, which it is. Uh, and the blockchain actually has many of those same characteristics. Uh, it, is a, it is a dandy way of just seeing what everybody's doing all the time, if that's what you want to do, it, do with it. Or it's a way of not doing that. And so you have plenty of choices that you can make. And I think you can make those choices responsibly. Uh, but the same, you know, the funny thing is this guy, this guy spent 2,000 words slagging me in the Washington Post on Friday, uh, and, and I thought, you know, it, I've been around trying to think about these things for, 
you know, almost 30 years. And the internet in the meantime has gone from maybe 800,000 people to billions. And yet, <coughs> almost all of the same problems that we had in 1985 are the problems that we have now. They're just writ much larger, that's all. I mean, it's still, there's still this Mexican standoff between the forces of oppression and, and, and surveillance and the forces of liberation. And uh, that's why, I mean, when, when we started the Electronic Frontier Foundation, we called it the Frontier Foundation, not the Freedom Foundation, because we knew that it would always be on the frontier. Mm -hmm. That, that, that for the rest of our lives, technology was gonna continuously make a new frontier that we had to figure out how to live on. Any other comment? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>